Great Awakening, and thank you for watching. We want you to share, like, invite. Let's get the word out to as many people as possible. Blueprints offer a clear roadmap for ensuring that every aspect of the project is executed with precision, accuracy, and excellence. It's here that I want to introduce our topic for today along with the series that we are starting. And the series that we are starting is Blueprint to Build. That's the short form of it because we are believing God for the blueprint to build. And so Blueprint to Build, and this is part one, and this message is entitled Dedication to Intercession. When we begin to build, I want us to focus on three areas of building. It's going to be precision, accuracy, and excellence. Can we say that together? Precision, accuracy, and excellence. This is why we want the blueprint to build, because we are not just trying to build what the church around the corner has or the church down the street. We're not trying to build what we feel would be good, but we are in an attempt to build that which God has given us the blueprint for. And so it is our desire now to build according to the specificity that God is laying out. I'll say it another way. It is our desire, Great Awakening Church, Great Awakening Global Network, and all of those who are friends and family, partners even. Our desire is to execute the plan of God with precision, accuracy, and excellence. A blueprint also acts as a point of reference for the teams as they move forward in the construction process, reducing errors and increasing productivity. Uh, we are now in our days of productivity. And if we are going to operate at maximum productivity, we must begin to reference the blueprint. We must begin to understand it. We must begin to know it. This is why we're having prayer clinics. This is why we're having training day part one and part two, because if we're going to begin to be a part of this house, and if we are going to build according to what God is saying, we must begin to navigate now reference the blueprint. We want to build with as little error as possible. As we navigate the new into uncharted territory, the blueprint ensures we don't do so blind. We will not be a people that build blindly. We will be a people that build according to the plan and the purpose that God has set on us individually, and that will come together corporately. Each of us should now start seeking God for the blueprint for the reason why he sent you here. There is something that he sent you here to help us build, but you have to start building in your area. I have to start building in my area. And when we put it together, we'll notice we got what's called the ministry. When you start building the kitchen and you start building the outreach and you start building the visual ministry and you start building, uh, yes, Lord, the praise ministry, what happens is when we put it together, we will have a ministry. And some churches don't have ministry. I'm supposed to be on my notes. But some churches don't have ministries because people never see themselves as personal contractors. They never see themselves, they never see themselves as someone responsible for helping build. And so we look at the prophet and say, he's going to build by prophesying. But what is my part in the building process? I ain't got no church here. Uh, what am I supposed to be doing? And this is why I show up on Sundays. I show up so I can get the next understanding and the next directive of where and what I'm supposed to build. Yes, Lord. Uh, I come to church and I get the power, I get the fuel to begin to build Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Thursday and Friday, I begin to now get the understanding and I don't build just according to my will, but I build according to understanding. I, I build according to the blueprint. Uh, uh, here it is. Here it is. As we navigate this new place, that's a sermon that I already preached. So it's on YouTube. You go find it. Uh, as we navigate this new place, we have to understand it's new. And that new place leads us to another place. I preach that too, uncharted territory. And as we are in uncharted territory, we end up here and we ask God for the blueprint to build. Even though it's the promised land that we are heading into, we still got to have a blueprint. E even though 
is not the place, even though this is not the place, uh, as we journey there, we can't get there and act like we don't know what to do. Uh Oh, I ain't got no help. Uh, uh, We can't get there and then start just getting so amazed that he did what he said that we miss now the opportunity to do what he said. Okay, we we get excited that God did what he said, but we got to get to the place of saying, hold up, wait a minute. Now I have to do what he said. There, there is something called a personal responsibility that I have to now partake in so that I can begin to be a benefit to my ministry. Mm. Blueprints offer a clear roadmap for ensuring that every aspect of the project is executed. When you have a blueprint, you don't pick and choose certain parts. Well, we're going to have a good prayer ministry, but then we forget about outreach. Or we're all outreach focused and then we forget. No, no, no. See, that's not a church if, 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 if it's just outreach. That's an outreach ministry. <laughs> but if we're going to be what God called us to be, we have different aspects, right? This is why we're talking to our single ladies. Come on here. Uh, because they had some questions and they had some things that they needed to work out with God. And so we built that. Come on here. This is why we go outside and feed our community. Why? Because we're building that. And as we begin to continuously build, we will notice that we are are reflecting what God has t- put us in earth to do. Mm. Yes, Lord. And so uh, uh, before we pick up our Bob the Builder hat and hammer, uh, we must, number one, here it is, pick up the burden. Mm. Yeah, okay, this side is going to be my preachy side, I can tell already. Uh, because we love to pick up the blue, and, and I kid you not, I was on Amazon, and I was like, Tanisha, I was like, you know what? I'm about to go get me a Bob the Builder hat just so y'all can really understand this message. I, 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 I might still be in my cart, but I was looking at them. And then I said, hold up, wait a minute. God said, no, you're not going to skip Nehemiah 1. Okay, I know some of y'all been in church, y'all done heard these type of series before, and we always talk about building and all of this, and what ends up happening is we skip Nehemiah 1, and Nehemiah 1 is, is how we get the blueprint. Oh, see, we want to skip to a sword in one hand and a, you know, okay, yeah, yeah, some of y'all know, know where we're going to end up at, uh, but before we get there, how do we get there? Intercession. Mm, I said, wow, God, this came right after the prayer clinic. You know what you're doing. Okay, and, and so uh, we have to pick up the burden. It's not that God isn't giving out burdens. It's not that they're not flowing and falling. It's that no one's picking them up. Uh Uh-oh, Jesus. uh Uh-oh, I just got an instant message. And so we we see here in the text, right, that they're coming to Nehemiah telling him what's wrong instead of someone doing something about it. Ooh, I wish I could talk to my leaders. Prophet, I got, hold on, wait, you a leader. So what are you going to do about the situation? What are you going to do about the circumstance before you bring it to me? What is the plan and the course of action? I'm about to lose my church. The plan and the course of action. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, This side is waking up now. Uh, What is the plan and the course of action? We know the problem. And thank you for telling me the problem. But all it does, according to the text, is make the leader weep. Oh, y'all, y'all didn't see. It, it just makes him mourn. But but when you come with a plan, come on here, then we can start moving in strategy, not just out of emotion. Oh, Jesus, I, I got to go. I got to go. And so Nehemiah hears that the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. He understands that they're under siege. And I don't know if they fought back or not, but something is wrong with the setup if all they're doing is telling him instead of doing something about it. Uh, And this is why I want us to really talk, because for us, we're not rebuilding much. All right. When Nehemiah deals with Nehemiah, as he as as the text deals with it, he's rebuilding. But what we are doing is building for the first time many things. Now, I'm going to get into us specifically uh, right after this message, because there's something we got to rebuild. And and I have to deal with this text, because when we understand this, we do not just allow the enemy to come in and tear things up. Oh, God, I got to go a little more, Linda. And, And so what happens, Sister Linda, is we get what God promised, but then we don't maintain what God promised. And then we look at it in this state. Gates destroyed. Walls broken down. We, we have to now move in such a place that we're going to maintain and take care of what God gives us. 
Yes, Lord. Uh, and so for us, this is still going to be very insightful because we're building for the first time. Uh, we've never been this way before, but we're still going to build. We don't know exactly all that is in the land, but we're going to build. However, uh, while we're building, we can't start neglecting. God help me today. Other areas of ministry, other partners. We cannot begin to start neglecting as we build. And so now as I move at a different part of the building project, somebody has to say, hold up, wait a minute. Uh, prophet can't do that now. I have to do it. And as I do it, I'm going to make sure that that is not left behind. I'm going to make sure that that is not being tore down while we try to build this. Mm. And so when he hears the news, his response was great to awakening. I want this to be a personal invite to invite you to worship God with us in person. We thank you for watching and we ask that you like, share and invite others. But we want to see you in person. 955 Connecticut Avenue, Bridgeport, Connecticut. You can sew either via Cash App or PayPal, or you can even mail it or bring it in person. We want to see you and worship. His response was to weep, mourn, fast and pray. My God. Uh, he hears the news and he says, you know what? I'm going to receive this burden. Uh, CJ, he says, you know what? I'm not going to be like everybody else and just spread the news and just have dialogue and conversation about what happened. I am going to take it personal. And this is why someone else is running to him, telling him, but he's the one crying. It's because of the fact that he took it personal. And whenever we're building, uh, yes, Lord, and if you're going to be a real partner of this ministry, I need you to start looking at this personally. This ain't Stefan's church. I know y'all call me prophet, but this ain't Stefan's church. This is our church. I'm the leader. Yes, I am. Hallelujah. But however, this is our church. And if your fingerprints are not on the DNA of this ministry, ministry. That means uh, I got to go back to this morning. You're following at a distance. Uh, it's not just good enough for people to follow the ministry, but I need you to get close with the ministry. Yeah. When, when, when we hear this, there is the four things here. We see him weep. We see him mourn. We see him fast and we see him pray. He doesn't just sit in pity once he receives this burden. He starts to move into what I like to call spiritual action. Sister Sylvia, he begins to now feel the burden, but he doesn't just sit there like some of us and say, I feel so burdened. No, he says, this is spiritual. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is spiritual. Uh, you've been tired week after week because you think it's your, your works. No, no, no. This is spiritual. And he takes this burden and he says, you know what? God is awakening me to pray. Oh, Jesus. But before he prays, he weeps. He acknowledges the natural. I, I, that ain't in my notes. I got I to gotta move from that. He acknowledges the natural. He says, I have an emotional response to how I feel about this. Mm. And some of us think we're going to advance, but not feel it emotionally. No. When you receive a burden from the Lord, you begin to cry. You begin to weep. You begin to get sad. You begin to miss meals. So you say, you know what, since I'm missing them anyway, I might as well fast. Because you have a burden. Mm. And, and some of us will never build anything great until we understand our spiritual toolbox. Mm. I was thinking about a toolbox, too, but I ain't going to do it. I have enough time to go get it. I was thinking about it now. Uh, and so we have to understand our spiritual toolbox. Now, what I teach you, and I'm going to keep saying it to y'all and know what I'm going to say, but what I teach you does not just work for a church. What I teach here from this pulpit, based on my assignment, works in every area of life that you invite God into. Okay? So here's our spiritual in, uh, a toolbox. We're going to go to it. I'm persuaded that this wasn't just any kind of weep. It was an intercessory weep. It was an intercessory weep. He wasn't just crying because he was sad. He was crying on behalf of what happened. Oh, God. He was crying because he says, you know what? They are not crying out, but I will. Because, God, I know Jerusalem is one of your holy cities. I know these are your people, your servants, those that you've called by name. And now I'm weeping as an intercessory act. See our tears. He was weeping on behalf of a nation that now, because of the state that he heard about it in, had no defense. 
<laughs> When's the last time you cried on behalf of America? Uh, I, I told you don't just work for church. And what happens is we keep looking at America fall into moral decay. We keep looking at it get worse and worse. We keep looking at burglary get worse and worse. And all we do is talk about it. We see the direction that our schools are going in. We see the direction that our money is going in. And all we do is just talk about it. We see that there is an assignment against us to kill us and get us overweight and get us all of these other things crazy and on medicine. And all we do is talk about it. And we keep talking about the man, but we're not praying. Yeah. And so when you get a burden, you weep on behalf of a nation. It's possible that 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 greed has our president blinded. And I ain't talking about our current president. I'm just talking. Uh, uh, but it's possible that those people, those scientists and those CEOs, they're blinded by greed. Who is the one that is going to weep until God begins to awaken them to the sin that they're doing? Yeah, yeah, I, I know that the desire of America is to get everybody on meds. Everybody's going to have a medical something. Come on here. Oh, uh, y'all don't want to talk to me today. Uh, that, that, that's the assignment of America. I don't even know if it's the enemy. I know it's America because greed. Uh, yes, Lord, I told you when I preach from here, I'm preaching as a prophet to nations. Uh, and so what happens is America is beginning to now just make money off of the back of its people and trying to push us into slavery. Y'all don't see it that way because you got a little income coming in. Uh, but this income back then would have got you a house, but now it doesn't. Uh-oh. Uh, yes, Lord. And why doesn't it happen? Because America is trying to push us back into slavery, not just black people anymore, but anybody who's not a part of the top 10%. And the reality is there needs to be someone to stand up as an intercessor and weep. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, weeping. Somebody say preach prophet. Uh, weeping is a technology. I just got that while I was standing here. Weeping is an intercessory technology. And when you can't put it in words, sometimes you got to cry. Sometimes you have to weep and let a sound out and it might not be intelligible to you. Yes, Lord. Uh, but God begins to interpret it and understand it. And some of you want to hold on to your tears. But God says, no, nah, I gave you that technology so that you can begin to now release prayers in liquid form. He understood. Yes, Lord. Uh, uh, it was a mourn that came next. He, he, he weeped, but then he mourned. And they're not the same thing, but I ain't got uh, a lot of time. He mourned it. He says, now I am saddened by it. I'm mourning. I'm not just weeping. Uh, but I love the fact that he weeped first as an action. I just told you. Uh, but in next in his intercessory toolbox, he used the tool of mourning. M-O-U-R-N. Mourn. Uh, to be sad. To be grievous. Uh, and this wasn't just sadness. It was a prophetic mourn okay so we got an intercessory weep but now we have a prophetic mourn he's mourning prophetically because he understands that if they have no walls and if they have no gate destruction is next mm. he, they begin to see he begins to see prophetically and he doesn't like what he sees see we get stuck cj we get stuck diana at the first level of prophecy and that's just seeing but we don't understand that we got to sit with God long enough to see if it's reversible. Y'all don't want to talk to me. It's in the book of Jonah. And in Jonah, what happens? They will be destroyed. He prophesies to them. They turn from their ways. Those people weren't destroyed. Now, that land ultimately got destroyed a couple of books later. <laughs> but those people didn't because they had enough sense to say, no, this is reversible. Okay, now, let me do it the way the church people know it. If my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray, then will I hear from him. he's not even hearing until we start turning. OK, and so now we're here at a prophetic morn. He does not like what he sees, but he understands that God has the power to turn it. Oh, God, uh, I wish I was talking to somebody who was in some trouble and you seen the way it was going to go. OK, but but then God, uh, after you started mourning the loss of it, he started to turn it. Uh, uh, he could feel the oncoming attack against Jerusalem, and he saw that, that, that they wouldn't be prepared, so he started mourning. He started mourning the bodies that probably were dead and were going to die. He started mourning. And we have to begin to stop looking at the news, looking at war, and just turning the channel. No, we have to pick up a prophetic mourn. Mm. I know we want to get to the place of building, uh, but before we build and before we buy, we've got to mourn. Ooh, 
Ooh, thank you, Taja. Uh, what are we mourning? We're mourning what will happen if we never live to the full potential that God's called us to. Who will not get saved if we don't continue Great Awakening Church? Oh, y'all getting quiet on me again. Who will not get delivered if we don't meet here on Sunday at 2 o'clock? Ooh. Uh, what person could, could, could come in here and they might have was about to commit suicide or commit mass murder, but they came in here and got delivered? I'm talking about we need to mourn uh, because what could be doesn't have to be. Mm. Yeah, we, we're in Bridgeport. We ain't, we, ain't, we ain't in Greenwich. We're in Bridgeport. There's a lot to mourn uh, about. And God is not just giving churches things uh, just so they'll have them anymore. I, I, I truly believe that. But he's giving us things so it can serve a purpose. And if we're not going to serve a purpose, then there is no need for us. And so he begins to mourn because if they don't continue to serve the purpose that God has placed them for, which was to be the servant of God, there's no need for them. And what could happen is now the oncoming attack can wipe them out. He understood if the gates are gone, everyone, including the enemy, had access. Here it is simple. Gates equal access. And so the Bible begins to mention the gates because now there is access. And when we mourn, we have to start stop getting happy about open doors and start wondering what's coming through. I ain't got no church. Uh, we got to stop saying, oh, it's my season of open door and start asking God what's coming through. Because if some of you saw what I saw, you would start mourning. Because what's coming through the door isn't just blessings. Mm. What's coming through the door is ju not just my best year. Because the reality of some of us, we ain't had the best year yet. Oh, okay, y'all don't want to be real with me. Okay, okay, so, some of y'all want to be real. You've been waiting on that. Stop declaring the best year and say, God, open my eyes to see. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Because better is the end of a thing anyway. So if, t if that was my best, then what do I have to look forward to? Oh, y'all don't want, <laughs> I'm a thinker. Okay. And, and, and so what happens is this morn is prophetic, and he's mourning the oncoming tack of Jerusalem. But also, uh, I'm not done. He then, he understands if the gates are, are gone, everyone and everything has access. But I said, now, that's the gates. But the wall was even destroyed. Mm. If the wall is gone, the first line of protection has been removed. Uh-oh, let me talk. There are no safeguards or boundaries in place when the walls are destroyed. We're not just a church, we're a wall. We're not just a wall, we're a gate. And some stuff cannot be allowed because we are a gate. And so we disallow. Come on here. I'm, I'm still talking about intercession. We, we are a gate, so we begin to have a safeguard or be a safeguard. But when the gates and the walls are destroyed, there's no safeguards, there's no barriers. Here it is. Walls also represent stability. When a community doesn't have a church, they're unstable. We're, we're, not just, uh, uh, we're not just building to build. We're not just building so our names could be great, so that we could be the next wonder. No, we are building because God has a plan and a purpose. Watch this for Bridgeport. And God has a plan and a purpose for Connecticut. And so he planted us here. I didn't choose to come here. He planted us here, and he planted us here so that we can begin to build, but according to the blueprint. I'm so close to being done, y'all don't even believe it. Yeah, uh, uh, if, I, if, I, if I can continue to explore this toolbox, I believe he was fasting in faith. Mm. Uh, uh, this wasn't just any old type of fast, but uh, I could tell that it was probably the natural progression that flowed from him weeping to mourning. He probably couldn't eat, so he said, you know what, let me just make this spiritual and start fasting. Now, I taught y'all, you can starve yourself, right? Just go without eating, right? I do that. If I get a couple of accounts back to back, I'm just working. But I'm not fasting. Even though I didn't eat for four or five hours. My wife get home like, why you ain't eat nothing? <laughs> now you're rushing me to cook. <laughs> but 
my mind was occupied. However, when I fast, I replace meals with prayer. Uh oh. I replace snacks with scripture. Y'all don't want to talk to me. Uh, this is fasting now. Every time I get a hunger pain, I say, Thank you, Jesus, because you're birthing something in me. I'm, I'm talking to fasters right here. Uh, uh, and so in this toolbox, I believe he was fasting in faith. He pulls out his faith and he says, God, well, I'm going to fast because I know that God begins to see the sacrifice of fasting. Mm. He believed turning his plate over would get God's attention concerning this matter. He believed turning his plate over, oh, yes, Lord, would allow God to turn some things over. And he says, you know what, as I turn my plate over, God, I want you to begin to turn things for people. Uh, and, and mind you, if they had to go get him, he wasn't even living in the area. He didn't know about it because he was living with the king. He was living good, but he had such a burden. He says, I know I'm living with the king, but what about them? Uh-oh, uh-oh. Oh, man, I'm about to mess up Mother Mamie. See, what happens is a lot of us only want to make sure that we good. Oh, I, I'm, I'm really supposed to be done with this point, but, but y'all are looking at me crazy, so I'm going to talk. Uh, and so the reality is we just want to be good. I, I just want to be straight. I just want to make sure all my, you, 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 you. And God is sitting there like, uh-uh, I gave you a burden for people. You keep thinking that your money is funny because, you know, other stuff is happening. No, it's because you have not accepted the burden to feed your community. You have not accepted the burden to tithe until the church gets to the place it's supposed to. You have not accepted the burden. Come on here to build the business. You have not accepted the burden to raise those kids that are not. You, you have not accepted the burden. <laughs> and so since you haven't accepted the burden, you don't have God's protection. Mm. Uh, because he will protect you as long as you are working according to his assignment. This is so amazing, and we'll learn it as we continue. Nehemiah is outside of the situation, uh, but they come to talk to him because they know that he will have favor over the situation. He's, and that's why I read the last verse, because he's in the king's house. Uh-oh. And he doesn't just, oh, I feel like yelling. Uh, he's not just in the king's house, right? But he has audience with the king. How do you know it? Because he's the cupbearer. The cupbearer is a trusted person. Oh, uh, uh, okay. I got a cupbearer over here. She brings me drinks. Uh, but the reality is if I didn't trust her, I wouldn't drink it. Y'all don't want to talk to me today. This is why at any church I go to, you got to bring it to me in a bottle and then open it. Come on here. Matter of fact, I'll just drink out the bottle. Uh, because the reality is I can't trust everybody as my cupbearer. But Nehemiah was the king's cup bearer. So he has audience with the king. And I believe that when we get audience with the king, we can ask the king for something. And because of our relationship, he'll grant it. Hmm. Let me move. Uh, he didn't just fast, but point number two, and I only have two points, so I'm almost done. Uh, he didn't just fast, but he entered intercession. He entered intercession. And what I love about this text is we get to dissect his intersection, intercession. We get to read what he prayed, because oftentimes the Bible will just say he prayed and it'll move on. But no, we get to read this prayer. And this is why uh, the next prayer clinic, I'll be teaching from Nehemiah 1. So y'all get ready and y'all be here. It should look just like this at the prayer clinic uh, because we're going to dissect this. But today I'm just going to give you an overview and then we'll flesh it out later. Uh, but what we see here in this intercession is the confession of sin. We, we see now that as an intercessor, he stands in between the people and God and he repents. He repents by confessing the sin that they committed. Yes, Lord Jesus. Uh, uh, if we're going to build according to God's blueprint for us, we must confess sin quickly. Oh, y'all don't hear me. Uh, uh, stop praying all of these other prayers. Uh, you, my leaning post, all of that's good. Confess your sins. Lord, I just want to please you. Confess your sins. You want to confess your sins because if you hear it, you'll stop doing it. Ooh. But what we want to do is we want because we don't think it's that bad. So then we God, if I did anything, you know, you have not been pleasing to God all week. And you talking about if I done anything. No, God, what I did was this and this and confess your sins. That's what the Bible says. And if you don't confess them to him, the next scripture says confess your sins one to another. So no matter what, we should be confessing. All right, thank you. Okay, so, so uh, if, if we're going to build according to God's blueprint for us, we have to confess sin, but watch this quickly. 
in the same moment of him crying and mourning and fasting for a couple of days, we see him begin to enter intercession. And in that intercession, he starts confessing sin. He says, you know what, God? Listen, God, we, we have not been in right alignment, which we have not been exactly where we've been supposed to be. Don't worry, I'll break it down for you even more. Because uh, 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 we, we have to begin to watch this take it personal. Turn to your neighbor and say, take it personal. I know y'all used to saying, don't take it. No, 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 take it personal. Uh, uh, because if your neighbor is sinning, it can now stop the progression of the blessings in your life. Take it, take it personal. What we like to do, Todger, uh, you've been sinning. No, 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 no. Let me begin to pray an intercessory prayer for Todger. Oh, y'all don't like that because we 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 done got this thing of holding people accountable, but we not holding ourselves accountable to intercession. <laughs> the sisters also smelled like cigarettes. Well, then why didn't you pray and intercede about the? Uh oh, y'all won't talk to me now uh, about about that spirit of addiction. It's not cigarettes. It's not weed. It's not alcohol. It's addiction. Come on, intercessor, and you gotta pray in that vein that God deliver them. Uh, oh Jesus! All right, all right, and so so we have to take it. Per somebody say take it personal. We got to take it personal. I like y'all today. Y'all y'all attentive. We got to take it personal. Uh, and so when we sin and understand we've done this, we have to understand we've done this. Watch this against God. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. You might have wronged. You might have wronged his house, but you really did it against him. Ooh. And and when you know you've done something against God the sustainer, you start saying, hold up, wait a minute, God, I got to get it right with you. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm going to move because y'all didn't grow up in the same type of church I did where people were, oh, if I done anything to you, no, that's not confessing. That's not, a f that's a if I've done, if I've done anything to you, <laughs> you know, you cussed me out last week, what you mean? Okay, let me, thank you. I'm trying to teach. Uh, all right. I added this to my notes where sin reigns, death also reigns. Those of you who were in Word Awakening know where I got it from. It's in Genesis uh, uh, where sin reigns, death reigns. And I, I ain't got time to go back through Genesis. Y'all y'all get ready for y'all lesson. Read it tonight. Uh, uh, but we see this from Genesis and we see it onward and it's not in my notes, but we also see it in Romans because the wages of sin is death. In other words, let me break it all the way down for my young folk in here. Uh, uh, the payment for your sin is death. The amount that you get paid for continuing in, continuing in sin is death. And, and this is why we must confess sin quickly. So it doesn't fester because when it festers, watch this, Steve, it reproduces. <laughs> we, we, we were sinning in just one area. I'm good. I just got that one area. And then we progress, Delia, and now it's two areas. Now it's three areas. Now it's four areas. And now we're sinning so much, we, we, we don't even know what God looked like, who he is. We, who's God? God, church, what's that? Because we're in sin. Mm. And I think we have to stop looking at sin as something that we just, oops. <laughs> we keep, <laughs> yeah, I like that. We keep looking at sin as a, oops, oops. I told a little white lie. Oops. Uh, I told them off. Oops, I can. And we got to start looking at sin like cancer. It's eating away at us. It's killing us. It, it, it's destroying what we need. It's making us fight against each other. Uh oh. And this is why we have to confess quickly. Watch this. If you confess it, you expose it. <laughs> we ain't got to sit here and walk by each other and not speak. No, 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 no. Listen, I was in sin for not talking to you and talking about you. It's exposed now. We can move on. We don't have to be best friends, but we can move on. I thought you was crazy when I first joined. All right, God bless you. We, we, we expose it, right? So, so that there's not this awkwardness between us. Why? Because we got to show up here and build. Okay. This is my problem with church folk. This is therapeutic for me, Tiff, so, you know. Help me out. Uh, uh, but here's my problem with church folk. They will continue to work and build with their coworkers that they don't like. But then call you their brother, 
call you their sister and walk by you and don't speak. And then think God's going to hear their prayer and bless them. That, that, that's the, the craziest part right there. Is that cognitive dissonance? I think that's what that is. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's a disassociation disorder or something, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd be reading the books. And so, yeah, th- there's something wrong mentally if you think that God is a God of love and he only loves you. Ooh, I, I said it in this sanctuary before and I'm going to say it again. God is not getting your enemy back because you're somebody's enemy. And do you want him to get you back? Uh-oh, we don't like that. So we might as well just begin to walk in love and start exposing and confessing our sin. Here it is. <sighs> and see, I like telling on myself because you, you, <laughs> you might miss a part and you might add a detail that wasn't there. And that's why I, I'd rather tell on myself. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, so, so when you are confessing, you must, and it's in verse 7. You can research it at your own time. But if you're going to confess, you must give a description of the departure. Mm. Uh, Where have I departed from what God has said? Uh Uh-oh. Where have I started going in a different direction than the blueprint that he gave me? Yeah. Uh-oh. Uh, well, God, I, I, I just, I haven't been feeling myself. I just haven't. No, no, no. Tell him where you departed. God, I haven't been in prayer in three weeks. I haven't read my Bible. I haven't studied nothing. Come on here. I have to begin to give a description of the departure. Y'all don't like intercession now uh, because it begins to put the onus on you. And you have to say, God, before I ask you to do anything for anybody else, let me describe how I failed you. Mm. Here it is in the text because I'm going to go over it. I told you we'll we'll really flesh it out when we get to, to, to the prayer clinic. But watch this. The Bible says they acted corruptly. (laughs) Uh, This term acted corruptly implies a uh, deliberate turning away from God's commands and a departure from righteousness. What is righteousness? Righteousness is doing what's right according to God's standard. Nehemiah used the use of the word corruptly emphasizes the severity of the sin. It wasn't a oopsie. <laughs> uh, this, 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 this would suggest a pattern of rebellion. Uh-oh, let me pause right there. If we're going to build, we got to get rid of the pattern of rebellion. Uh-oh, uh, uh, I don't know which side heard me, so I'm going to say it again. We got to get rid of the pattern of rebellion. Uh-oh, so then that means we have to obey quickly. So it might be a small instruction, but we got to obey it. I'm, and y'all think I'm talking about coming from me. I'm talking about coming from God. Because <laughs> God might tell you to bless me, uh, but I'm in a situation because you haven't obeyed. Your obedience affects someone else. Mm. Oh, Jesus. And, and, and so it's severe, right? You, you don't know what your hug would have did for me, but you didn't obey God. Oh, buddy, you, you didn't know that in your arms, your two jiggly arms, he put deliverance from depression. Y'all don't want to talk to me. <laughs> Ain't nobody sleeping on me today. I'm waking everybody up. Come on here. Y'all need to get with Jay Grips. Come on here. Body by Jeff. Amen. And, and so. They somebody say departed. It suggests a pattern of rebellion and disobedience that had continued over time. Let me go through this quickly. Uh, we haven't kept what Moses said is what he said, right? So they acted corruptly, but next, they haven't kept what Moses said. They stopped obeying the prophet. They stopped obeying the leader. Now, if you understand, we're in Nehemiah, right? What book are we in? Moses is dead. But his instructions still stand. Uh, uh, The prophet might not be in your presence, but what he said still has to be done. Uh, And so Nehemiah shows us three areas they departed from into disobedience. I almost call this departure into disobedience. Uh, They departed into disobedience, number one, in commands. 
What are commands? I'm glad you asked, Elder Denise. These are direct instructions given by God. They departed in another way. They departed in statues. What are statues? I'm teaching today. Uh, statues refer to a specific law or regulation established by God to govern worship and conduct of his people. So, so not only were they, oh, yes, Lord, not only were they not listening to God directly and how he directly told them to do things, they weren't even listening to the statues, the, the, the level that he told them to live at. So it's one thing to not go left when God says go left. It's another thing when he says wear a talit, wear a prayer shawl, and you don't do it. That's a statue. But then it's not just a command they departed in. They departed that way. They departed in statues, commands. But watch this. They departed in ordinances. Ordinances are ceremonial requirements instituted by God relating to observance and practice. What are examples of this? Because I had to. Make sure I understood it. Circumcision, Passover. Th this is an ordinance. And so it might not be a daily thing, but there's something that God told you to do as a ceremonial requirement. And so when, 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 when Nehemiah starts repenting on behalf of the people in intercession, as he enters intercession, he says, God, you have now released to me the parts, uh, the places of departure. It was in commands. It was in statues. It was in ordinances. And if we're going to build something that lasts past our lifetime, lest the Lord should come, then we cannot depart in commands and statues or ordinances. We have to build it the way he said, and we have to obey every command, and we have to obey every statue, and we have to obey every ordinance. We can't pick and choose when we will obey. After he repents on behalf of the people, he does what good intercessors do. This, this is not uh, basic intercession. Now we're moving into the intermediate. He reminds God of his word. We got a lot of intercessors who don't know the word. Whether that be prophetically or whether that be logos. And therefore, they're not able to remind God of anything. Mm -hmm. God, you said in your word, but you, you, you're not even sure that it was said uh -oh, in the word. And you're looking for God to do something that you said was in the word, but it ain't there. It ain't in the Greek. It ain't in the Hebrew. It ain't in NIV, KJV, CSB. It ain't there. And so he repents on behalf of the people, and then he reminds God of his words. When dialoguing with God through intercession, remind him of what he said, because what he said stands and will not become a lie. Sometimes we're not seeing what God said because we're not reminding him of it. Now, uh, this, this term remind means to rehearse. It doesn't mean to bring back to memory. And so what happens is as I rehearse what God said to me, I get to hear it again. And faith comes by and hearing by. Uh oh, the word of God. And so as I hear the word of God again, as I'm reminding him, it's doing something for me. It's helping me to stand fast. It's helping me to stay in the struggle. Come on here. And so as it does something for me, it shows God that I heard it and I took it serious. You have to know. Turn to your neighbor and say, you have to know what he said. All right. I'm done playing softly. He reminds God of their purpose and relationship. This is still an intercession. He says, God, I, I told you we're in the intermediate. I want you to remember the purpose with which you placed us here. You placed Israel here to be your servants. Mm -hmm.